my earthly dad was blessed with many talents. I always admired how he thought much and spoke little, and how when he did speak, it was always meaningful and for a purpose. One of his many accomplishments was that of a pilot and instrument flight instructor. He took my sisters and me up only three times that I can recall, but it made an impression. And when I was 14, I asked Dad to teach me to fly. He didn't say anything, but the next evening when he came home, he handed me a flight manual and he said, Read this. Tell me when you're finished. I don't have to tell you that at 14, I didn't have the discipline or desire to scour and absorb an instruction manual. And that wasn't at all what I had imagined when I asked him to teach me. I had imagined when I asked that he'd start taking me to the field with him and maybe teach me hands-on. Instead, he hands me a manual and walks away. I never learned to fly. And it took me many years to understand and come to terms with his reasoning for the way that he handled my request. Flying a plane isn't something that you go into half-heartedly. Every decision counts. Mistakes can be devastating. I mentioned to you that he was an instrument flight instructor. And he told me a little about what that meant and the certification requirements. For Part 61 instrument rating, 50 hours of cross-country flight time as a pilot in command was necessary, and that includes 250 nautical miles of direct routing from an air traffic control facility, 40 hours of instrument time, 15 hours of which is with an authorized instructor who holds an instrument airplane rating, and an instrument approach at each airport, and three different kinds of approaches with use of navigational systems. Why is all that so important? I remember two times that my father spoke of where he had to make an emergency landing. One was due to an engine malfunction and the other for unforeseen extreme weather conditions. Both times he had to make precarious emergency landings. And when he stood before the review board each time to give an account of the situation and his actions, he was found not only faultless, but skilled and heroic in the way that he handled things. Dad wasn't being aloof in his approach with me. He wanted me to show both him and myself that I would take this serious enough to put in the needed time and effort to do it right, and in such a way that I'd be ready and equipped to think on my feet and, and recall my training and handle adversity when it struck without warning. In Luke 14, 28, Jesus speaks to his disciples about counting the cost. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? The Holy Spirit brought all of this to mind the other day as I was pondering the week's events without going into a lot of detail and being careful to not speak disparagingly. I'll just say that life in my immediate family can be challenging and hard sometimes. I know that I'm not alone. I've spoken with some of you, and, and I pray for you. My Lord had been very quiet for a few days, and he had also orchestrated a quiet time between my closest brethren and me. I was dealing with difficulties inside the house and around my house and at my door from far away, and the storms just seemed relentless and to only intensify. I went outside one night and just sat in my car, and, and I cried out to my Lord, Father, I can't hear you. Help me, Father. Father, I'm weary and I need you. Show me what to do. It's so hard, Father, but I won't quit. I thank you for whatever you're doing because I know it's for my good purpose. But still there was only silence and I couldn't see out of the window in the cockpit. Whatever you're doing, whatever's going on, Father, I trust you. And I'll remember my training. I'll fly by instrument and I thank you again, Father. Even though I can't see or hear, I thank you. I went inside and, and I laid down and I awoke to more of the same. It was around 5 a.m. And, and I was getting my husband off to work and texting and trying to help another. And a sister who'd been awakened earlier by the Lord texted with a message from him. <laughs> praise God for his message of hope and encouragement. And praise God the test of silence and darkness was over. I could see past the storm. My father and I talked about what I did right and, and what I learned that I can do better. He said, keep your eyes on me, Rhonda. Don't focus on the storm. I'll get you through. 
I know that he'll test me again. We are each placed where we are for a purpose. And these trials and testing that we endure aren't to punish us. They're to prepare us for what lies ahead and to equip us for every good work and to produce in us endurance and patience and faith. And they're to learn from so that we might help and encourage other brethren who might be struggling also. I close with these verses. 1 Peter 1, 6 through 9. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you've not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy and expressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Matthew 28, 20 Teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Deuteronomy 31.8 the Lord is the one who goes ahead of you. He will be with you. He will not fail or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. 2 Samuel 7:28. And now, O Lord God, you are God, and your words are true, and you have promised this good thing to your servant. Isaiah 26, 3. I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on me because he trusts in me.